From today, we will learn uh, vesicular trafficking, secretion, and uh, endocytosis. Uh, so, uh, so this lecture uh, will be heavily based on uh, some early literature and uh, historic data that how we uh, know what we know today. And uh, I hope that uh, you will find it exciting. Uh, this is definitely one of my most favorite uh, chapters. So first some, uh, you know, initial overview that uh, we know what actually happens, right? that uh, proteins are uh, like proteins begin to be synthesized in the cytosol and their ribosomes uh, latch onto the mRNAs, they scan it, start translating. Those that are uh, you know, destined to be secreted, they will have a signature uh, peptide in the N-terminus, which is called the signal peptide, because of which they will be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and then the uh, the the proteins uh, get vectorially uh, you know injected into the ear lumen and from there on they are transported through vesicles from uh, ER to golgi to uh, you know different stacks of golgi to eventually outside of the cell and also you know like uh, proteins that uh, are taken up in the cell from outside uh, by endocytosis, they you know come in. They uh, sometimes they are uh, destined for degradation in the lysosome. Uh, sometimes uh, they are transported to uh, different uh, like subcellular compartments, and also. Uh, there is some transport uh, from the, the different membranous organelle like the transmedial cis Golgi uh, uh, and ER uh, within them that can happen in the reverse direction than the other ones. So uh, the, this we know. The chapter that we will discuss uh, in the next three lectures uh, actually is an enormous amount of work. And uh, there are four different Nobel Prizes and uh, uh, <clears throat> you know uh, eight different Nobel laureates whose work we will be uh, discussing, eight or nine different Nobel laureates whose work we will be dis discussing here. Uh, the saga started with uh, Camilio Golgi and Santiago Ramani Cajal. Uh, they, you know, basically devised some staining processes by which uh, you can, uh, you know, stain into the sub uh, subcellular organelle. And uh, even today, the, the stains are used. Uh, and, you know, like uh, you may know that uh, like the, the the Golgi stain that dev was developed by uh, Camilio Golgi uh, was uh, used by many, including Ramani Kahal. And the drawings that Ramani Kahal made uh, for some of the neurons uh, are still considered the gold standard. Like, uh, you know, in the early 19th century, late 18th century, uh, with the kind of microscope he had access to with that, his observations and uh, those were drawing, hand drawn. Uh, but even today, uh, people refer to those uh, hand drawings as the gold standard for many of the neural subtypes that uh, we discovered today with the, using molecular marker. And then, uh, of course, uh, you know, Albert Claude, Christian Duve, uh, and George Pallady, uh, their work, you know, like, uh, uh, uncovering the structural and functional organization of the cell. Uh, I will talk a lot about uh, Pallady's work. And then Gunther Blobel, who was mentored by Pallady, by the way. And uh, uh, he got the Nobel Prize all by himself, just because of his discovery of the signal peptide and the entire mechanism of uh, you know how uh, secretory proteins uh, are uh, you know uh, uh, inserted into the endoplasmic reticulum? He worked out every single detail of it, and uh, whatever he discovered, 
1999, actually even before that, um, 1991, uh, is still considered the gold standard. And uh, then work of uh, Randy Sheckman, Jim Rothman, and Thomas Suzu uh, uh, for their work in uh, figuring out the detail of the molecular mechanism from ER to Golgi to outside of the cell. And the names that are in red are those, uh, uh, like will be the focus of uh, this series of lectures. I will cover their work. And I will strongly, strongly uh, recommend that you listen to all the, the, the Nobel lectures. You know, those are the most lucidly stated uh, talks and uh, listening to those lectures uh, will help you enormously uh, to understand uh, this topic. You know, the, like, you know, the, those were the stalwarts. So if you uh, listen to their, uh, them about their work, that will do a much better job than what I can do uh, narrating their work for you. So yeah, please uh, listen to all the Nobel lectures. Those are all available in the Nobel archive. Now, you know, the fundamentally the process of intercellular trafficking is uh, conceptually very simple. You know, it is because our cell membrane and intercellular membranes, they behave like soap bubbles. Okay? They stick to each other, they bud up from each other, and you know, they're made of uh, fairly similar uh, stuff. And uh, one thing that you would like to note here that the intercellular membranes, they are result of invagination of the cell membrane. So the cell membrane, it has uh, like uh, two phases, right? One is the exoplasmic phase, meaning the facing outside of the cell, and the other is the cytosolic phase. And uh, they have different lipid composition. So if you are following those lipids, and if you look at it a little carefully, you will see that, uh, you know, like here the black is out, the red is inside, uh, you know, uh, and then in the, the mitochondrial membrane, red is outside, black is inside, and the inner mitochondrial membrane, again, black is outside, red is inside. Uh, in the Golgi and uh, membrane, it is the red is outside, black is inside. Wherever there is a second membrane, uh, you know, like there, the black is outside, red is inside. So it is multiple times invagination, just the way it is shown here, that if you just invaginate this, then you can uh, get uh, this kind of uh, uh, you know or organization. So that itself gives you some idea that uh, the membrane-bound organelle uh, they are being produced through rearrangement of uh, the the cytosolic membrane. Okay, and as I uh, told you earlier, that the traffic happens in multiple directions once the proteins have started their uh, journey in the cytosol. Okay. Now, all of this is possible because of the extremely fluid nature of the cell membrane. And uh, we all know that uh, uh, it is called the fluid mosaic model. Uh, the cell membrane is called fluid mosaic. And it was uh, first shown by uh, formation of uh, heterokaryons. Okay? Hetero means different, karyons mean nuclei. Uh, nucleus. So if you artificially fuse a human cell with a mouse cell, and then if you have antibodies against uh, the cell surface marker, which is only present in the human cell or in the mouse cell, then initially you will see that the markers are like soon after uh, fusion, the markers are displayed on either side of the heterokaryon. But with time, they will uh, intermingle. Okay. And uh, within 40 minutes, you can see them uh, to be homogeneously distributed. And it is possible uh, if and only if there is a diffusion within the plane of the membrane, okay? Uh, and uh, that's what is referred to as, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the, that's what is referred to as uh, the, the fluid mosaic model. And uh, nowadays it is uh, demonstrated using much more sophisticated mechanism. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you know that uh, the one mechanism is called FRAP, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. Uh, it is very simple, just uh, as simple as it uh, sounds. 
that uh, you have a, a specific kind of a cell membrane uh, marked uh, possibly with antibody, which will be tagged with a fluorescent tag. And then you uh, uh, bombard it with laser. If you bombard it with laser, eventually the fluorescence will be extinguished. So uh, on the surface of the cell, there will be an area where there will be no fluorescence. Now you just leave it and you will see that uh, eventually the fluorescence will be recovered there. And uh, we know that this recovery is not because the bleached molecules uh, gain fluorescence again, but rather molecules that were not bleached, but in other areas out, uh, outside of uh, this zone, uh, into that area, fluorescent molecule from other places just moved in. Okay. Now you can actually quantitate it. You can uh, observe it under the microscope with the real-time uh, like live cell imaging, and you can actually um, uh, tell that exactly how long it is taking to recover the fluorescence at the bleached uh, area. And the that rate of fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching, if it is slow, then you can uh, say that the, this particular membrane is not as fluid as the other membrane. Uh, if it is fast, uh, so you, you can actually characterize the membrane property based on the rate of uh, fluorescence recovery. And uh, there is uh, another technique, fairly uh, related technique, which is called uh, FLIP, which is fluorescence loss in photo bleaching. So here, what you do, is you actually uh, 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 like uh, you uh, hit with laser a particular area, uh, like this is the bleached area, and then you measure the fluorescence level in another area, okay, in here. So if fluorescent molecules are moving in from here into here, then some fluorescence will be lost here, right? And the rate at which, and if you keep on bleaching this part and it will keep on moving in, and uh, you know, like the molecules that just moved in, they will again get bleached, so more molecules will move in. So eventually you will uh, create another area where there will be no fluorescence, right? So the loss in that other area here, in the measurement area, uh, if you plot it with time, you will see the fluorescence loss with time. So this is just uh, another method. These are methods by which you can characterize different types of cell membranes. Now, uh, you know, like, uh, how would you want to discover the processes players involved in secre secretion? You know, it is all happening inside of the cell. Um, as you will see later that, uh, you know, uh, blocking secretion is not a very good idea because uh, the cell will be very, very sick, but though uh, similar, like somewhat uh, related experiment has been done, but you know, like uh, a whole lot was discovered using biochemistry and uh, I will be uh, talking about that. But before I get into this uh, chapter, I will, uh, very quickly tell you some of the methods for cell and organelle secretion. And here, uh, so sorry, it's, it's, it's a cell and organelle, uh, like how to separate them. Um, the one machine that is uh, universally used is called a centrifuge. It is used even today. Uh, these centrifuges are not the tabletop centrifuge that you generally refer to. There are some tabletop centrifuges that are also used, but mostly these are floor model centrifuges. These are really large, very heavy machines. And uh, there, the rotor can spin at a really high speed. You know, when it is spinning at a really high speed, uh, if it has friction with air, then it will create a, an enormous amount of uh, heat and that will destroy all biological samples. So therefore, um, there is a vacuum. So the vacuum uh, is applied only when the chamber is uh, completely in vacuum, then only the rotor will start uh, moving. So uh, that reduces the friction. And on top of that, there will be refrigeration. Uh, there will be condenser that will 
cool the chamber. So therefore, the samples will not uh, be degraded uh, with time. And most of the time, the two different kinds of uh, subsedimentation uh, approaches are taken. Uh, one is, uh, you know, uh, simply you uh, spin it at a different speed. Uh, initially, if you just if you just slice open a cell, uh, spin it lightly, uh, the membrane and uh, some of the cytoskeleton associated with membrane uh, and the nuclei, uh, they will all come in the pellet. Whatever is in the supernatant, you take that out, spin again, and now you will get some of the heavier membrane-bound organelle like uh, mitochondria, lysosome, peroxisome, etc. Again, you take the supernatant, spin it, uh, what you will get is uh, microsomes, small vesicles. These are, now we know that these are fragments of uh, in, uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, 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 and, uh, you know, and, and Golgi. Okay, and you take the supernatant again and spin it at a very, very high speed for a very long time. Uh, you will get in the pellet uh, viruses, the ribosome, large macromolecules, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one way of getting uh, these uh, subcellular components in, uh, you know, in different, uh, like you separate them from each other. But uh, imagine that you want to get, uh, you know, these uh, small recycles uh, in uh, or, uh, you know, certain proteins, uh, you want to isolate them. Uh, so then this is not a very good method. This is a rather crude method. So there are uh, two kinds of uh, sedimentation processes that uh, are used, uh, velocity sedimentation or equilibrium sedimentation. Now, uh, velocity sedimentation and equilibrium sedimentation, uh, you know, on the face of it, they are not dramatically different, but, you know, like two molecules having identical molecular weight uh, if they have different kinds of shape, then they can have different kinds of buoyancy. Okay, so uh, therefore, uh, you know, like uh, uh, in a viscous medium, uh, they might uh, attain equilibrium at uh, different uh, conditions, uh, concentrations, so depending on their shape. So uh, two different kinds of uh, centrifuge sedimentations are done. This is done using a machine called ultra centrifuge that can go at a very high speed. Um, in one, in velocity uh, sedimentation, what you do is that you have a, um, a very uh, heavy, uh, you know, uh, um, like a, a stabilizing sucrose gradient, and uh, it is generally used uh, sucrose. And then you load the sample on the top and you just uh, spin it and you get the slow sedimenting component and the fast uh, sedimenting component. And then you can puncture them at the bottom and uh, you can collect fractions. And, uh, you know, like uh, the drops you collected first, uh, you know, that will be the, uh, you know, like uh, from. Uh, this region, okay, the blue. So the first tube is all blue. Second tube will be all blue. Then in some tube, this part will come. So so that's the third tube, okay. And then again, there will be some uh, buffer, okay, uh, fourth, fifth, sixth. Then this red part will come. So now you have two different, uh, you know, macromolecules or recycles uh, that uh, differ in, uh, uh, you know, their molecular weight. Uh, they are separated into different tubes. And uh, uh, a much more uh, commonly used one that I have used a lot also is uh, to use a gradient centrifugation. So you will have a gradient, you know, like uh, uh, this gradient is made uh, something like this. Uh, so you will have a tube. This. You make a tube. Um, it's a um, uh, it's a, a capillary tube, and uh, uh, then you have a chamber. You have a second chamber, and there is a 
connecting tube between the two. Maybe I should draw the tube a little lower. Connecting tube between the two. And then there is a stock cock here, okay? And then there is a small tube that comes out, okay? Um, then you uh, put this whole thing on top of a um, uh, uh, mag magnetic uh, rotor, okay? And then you put a tiny magnet in here, okay? Um, here you will have, uh, you know, 70% super solution. Here you will have 20% super solution. Now what will happen is that when you start the uh, stutter, magnetic stutter here, then the first drop that will come out of here will have 70% sucrose in it, right? And the moment the first drop came, and if your tap is open, just because there has been a displacement here, so one drop equivalent fluid will move from here to here. So the next drop that will come, that will be slightly lower than 70% sucrose. And it will keep on happening and slowly, you know, it will go from 70% to, you know, little less and then little less and then little less. So you will create a, a linear gradient of 20% to 70%, you know, like uh, the heaviest at the bottom, lightest at the top. You uh, apply your samples, spin them, and, uh, you know, like the, depending on the buoyancy of the molecule or the, the you know, organelle, etc., they will sediment, they will settle at uh, different places. And no matter how long you spin them, they will not move from here because here their buoyancy is identical to the, uh, uh, you know, like the specific gravity of the fluid that they are in. But here in the velocity sedimentation, if you keep on uh, spinning, they can slowly uh, come down a little bit more. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. And these are very, very effective ways of, uh, you know, uh, separating uh, cellular components. Um, also, you can capture uh, small vesicles through antibody trapping, the same thing. You know, you know some cell surface molecule, you use an antibody against it, and uh, that you can uh, 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 couple with, uh, here it has been shown as a bacterial cell, but you can have uh, this uh, protein A can be tagged to agarose. You, know, you can use protein A agarose. Protein A is a, a bacterial protein that can bind, uh, any antibody can bind to it, okay? So uh, you take the thing in the, in the, in the vertebrate cell, uh, add the antibody to a cell surface marker. In this case, they added antibody against clathrin, and then uh, you add uh, protein A, uh, sepharose. Uh, so sepharose is an insoluble, uh, you know, uh, polymer. It is coupled to protein A. So protein A will be uh, uh, will bind to the antibody. Antibody is bound to the cell, uh, and then the whole thing can come down. Not the cell or a coated vesicle. The whole thing can come down. Okay. So you, you can isolate it like that. So how were the basic processes discovered? If you read the 1975 uh, Nobel lecture, uh, unfortunately, Pallady's lecture is not available as a um, uh, video lecture or a recorded lecture. It is available as a um, uh, science paper, okay? Uh, so if you read that paper, you, you'll see that uh, uh, one thing that uh, changed uh, biological science investigation of his type uh, was uh, electron microscopy. You know? uh, the advent of electron microscopy technique uh, allowed people to investigate the inside of the cell uh, like ne ne never before. Okay? Uh, by the way, you should not uh, think that you know, it was uh, like a, an easy thing to do. Uh, even a uh, uh, you know, few years back, establishing the protocol for electron microscopic investigation of a new sample type by itself was a PhD thesis topic. Right? It will often take in uh, two, three, four years. Okay? So the days that we are talking about, uh, it was 
it must have been inordinately difficult. So people who actually standardized it, they were uh, outstanding uh, scientists. So uh, once the electron microscope uh, grouping investigation of the cellular structure was possible, then you have two options. One is you can expand horizontally, you can look at different kinds of cells and you can figure out, okay, these are the common features, these are not, and that, that you can do, you know, like uh, you can go into multiple different cell types. Or you can try to get farther and farther uh, detail uh, for a particular uh, intercellular organelle. Okay. But you could not go much beyond it. You could not uh, ask uh, functional questions. Okay. And that's where Paradis genius came. So Paradis decided to combine biochemistry with electron microscopy uh, and subcellular fractionation and very uh, you know, uh, uh, ingenious use of radioactivity to <clears throat> ask uh, functional questions. Okay? And that's what was uh, Paladis' uh, genius. So, uh, you know, uh, as uh, stated here, that Caro and Paladis for the first time combined autoradiography, meaning use of radioactivity, with electron microscopy. And uh, it was extended further when they could do their experiments in vitro, like in slice cultures. You know, slice cultures are still used. If you go to Professor Janaki Sen's lab, uh, you get to see the slice culture, uh, uh, the device with which slice cultures are made. And uh, brain is still studied heavily in slice culture. So slice culture is basically you take, instead of uh, the whole animal, which is the in vivo study, or just uh, you know, cell culture, which is individual cells, it is somewhat in, be in between. You can call it kind of an ex vivo system. So you take a slice of a tissue, which will be reasonably thick, 100 micron or a little bit more. And because the architecture is largely intact, so many of the in vivo processes can study, be studied in slice culture. Okay. So this is uh, one uh, set of photomicrographs from Paladis lecture. Uh, so these were the electron microscopic studies that he conducted in 1950s and 60s. So you can see that you know he marked the, the mitochondria. Uh, these are the rough endoplasmic uh, reticulum. Uh, here, you know, this is the cytosol. Uh, this is the 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 uh, so this is in the, 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 the cisternal space of the endoplasmic reticulum. And you can see that this is the endoplasmic reticulum and these black spots, those are basically the ribosomes. So those are the attached ribosomes. You see, like uh, he marked them as AR, attached ribosomes. And, uh, you know, like uh, th these were done in 1950s, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, he could see the the attached ribosomes as the large ribosomal subunits and then uh, the the small ribosomal subunits uh, like the, these are the small ribosomal subunit these are the large uh, ribosomal subunit okay uh, so they could see all of this and uh, you know like now they can ask uh, all sorts of different kinds of questions so what uh, they did together uh, with his postdoc, uh, Sir Sikavitz, is that uh, they labeled, uh, and you know, like these people were extremely, extremely smart, and uh, you know, they knew exactly what to do. So you see, they chose to do their studies on pig pancreas. Okay, pig may not be very important for this particular uh, context, but pancreas is very, very important. Why? Because pancreas is a, a organ that is specialized for secretion. So if you were trying to study secretion, um, instead of, uh, you know, like say the muscle cells, uh, you would like to do it with pancreas because a lot of secretion is happening there. So the machinery that is uh, professional, uh, uh, whose professional job is to uh, assist the, the secretary processes will be very prominent in there. So 
they would do that and you know like uh, they, they they decided to look at uh, one of the most abundantly secreted protein called gametocytogen okay and they asked a very simple question that if we inject radioactivity in pig then uh, it is c14 leucin where do you get to see the radioactivity in the protein in the in, in chymotrypsin okay and they observed that it was associated with the attached polysome primarily whether it is after 1 minute of injecting the leucin or after 3 minutes of injecting the leucin majority was associated with the attached polysome and uh, with the free polysome very little was uh, uh, found so uh, therefore because chymotrypsinogen is a secreted protein so they could come to the conclusion that uh, chymotrypsinogen synthesis is uh, primarily happening on those polysomes who are uh, which are uh, associated with the endoplasmic reticulum um, but you know it was not uh, immediately uh, clear that the proteins that are destined to stay in the cytosol in the cytosol uh, uh, you know like uh, uh, Like they, they're, you know, like here in the free polysome also there is some radioactivity, right? So the question is that uh, is it just uh, contamination or is it that these uh, proteins that are secreted uh, they first begin to be synthesized on the free polysomes, the free ribosomes, and then they attach to the rapid endoplasmic reticulum. Today we know that it is correct. That's what happens. But in 1960s. Palladi was the one who discovered that that's what happens, that uh, because you see some radioactivity with free polysomes, uh, he speculated, okay, he could not, like, uh, the, the, the infrastructure was not uh, adequate for him to definitively conclude that this is what is happening, but he speculated that because no matter what time you always see some radioactivity for chymotrypsinogen is attached, uh, is, is associated with the free polysome, but majority is with the attached polysome, so it is possible that they, are, they start to get synthesized in the cytosol. Uh, where the cytosolic proteins are made, and then it gets attached to the uh, ER membrane. And uh, by this time, it was known that uh, IgG has a very special sequence on its end terminus. So Pallade speculated that this special sequence may function as a signal for attachment. Okay? That was a speculation, of course. Then the question is that, uh, you know, he uh, also figured out that I'm not getting into that uh, right now because I will cover it a little later, that these proteins like chymotrypsinogen, et cetera, those that are destined for secretion, they get vectorially transported into the ear lumen, okay, uh, which is uh, referred to as this uh, CM thing here, okay, like, sorry, C uh, CS thing here, okay. Uh, but the question is that, and, and, and he knew that once it gets inside the endoplasmic reticulum, it cannot come out. But they are secreted outside of the cell. So how do they go? How do they move? So uh, he asked a very simple question that uh, where are these proteins? After they are made, where are these proteins? So uh, this time he used a different uh, protein to chase, uh, it is amylase. And he was just looking at <coughs> the amylase count. Uh, for first, the overall, like the all proteins, okay? All proteins. Uh, where is the radioactivity being incorporated? If you grow them in, uh, in, uh, um, the uh, radioactive medium, uh, why is the radioactivity getting uh, incorporated? 
So uh, initially, uh, you see that uh, the count in the medium uh, is initially going up and then it gets stabilized. So it is, uh, you know, like uh, the uh, the my medium here. Uh, it, what is meant is that uh, you know, like uh, where you are growing it, okay. Uh, and with the ribosome, you see that it goes up and then it stabilizes. And he used he he looked into another fraction, which is a membrane fraction. And how did he define membrane? He defined it as a uh, uh, the organelle, which is soluble in like a proteins, which are, you know, which can uh, come out in the soluble fraction if you treat them with deoxycholate. Deoxycholate is a, a detergent. And you see that the deoxycholate uh, soluble fraction, they initially go up, uh, you know, like uh, pretty sharply, but they, uh, you know, just when the Ribosomal, the 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 ribosome associated count uh, plateaus. That's it, this count still continue to increase. Okay, but you know that is the whole protein, uh, all the proteins together. So this is the average one. If you look at only a secreted protein amylase, then you see that while the ribosome associated count plateaus after some time. But the dox soluble count keeps on increasing, um, and uh, it keeps on increasing even after the ribosome count, associated count, has saturated. Okay, so it simply means that uh, the proteins that are that were initially like the it is only for the amylase, right? So amylase proteins that were initially associated with the ribosome they eventually get transferred into this dox soluble uh, uh, membrane. And that's why the count keeps on increasing there with time. Okay, Even when the ribosome associated count has saturated. Uh, nowadays, of course, you know, it has been demonstrated with uh, uh, like a much more uh, ease, I would say, but the conclusion still remains the same. If you simply look at a a fluorescent uh, protein that is uh, uh, like uh, in this case they took a JP tagged membrane protein and you uh, transfect it and you just observe and observe under the fluorescence microscope uh, and you see in a in a time lapsed uh, video imaging you see that initially the JP is in the endoplasmic reticulum okay and then uh, soon after that you know, around 40 minutes, uh, the fluorescence is uh, concentrated in uh, the structure which is the Golgi. And at 180 minutes, like three hours later, you get to see that the fluorescence is primarily on the plasma membrane. And if you quantify it, you will see that the ER associated fluorescence, it uh, dips rapidly. And as it is dipping, first, there will be an increase in the Golgi associated fluorescence and then it goes down and then comes the plasma membrane associated fluorescence and eventually that also comes down. But the, just look at this that uh, as this is coming, the Golgi is going up. So the Golgi peak is around here around 40th minute and the plasma membrane peak is around 180th minute. So that uh, demonstrated that proteins that are destined to the membrane, and you know that uh, you know majority of the pathway remains the same for the membrane protein or the secreted protein. And the protein that is uh, destined for the membrane uh, initially is uh, associated with the ER, then it is associated with the Golgi, and finally it is associated with the uh, 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 plasma membrane. Okay. Um, then Pallady, uh, in Pallady's group, like uh, you see, this is published in 1970, uh, 
by David Sabatini and uh, Gunther Blobel, but this work was done in Paladin's lab. Okay? Like if you uh, hear Paladin's Nobel lecture in 1975, he refers to this as uh, work done in his uh, group. So uh, here, uh, what they did is they just wanted to see uh, that uh, you know, newly synthesized polypeptides. How do you know newly synthesized? Because they will again add radioactivity. Like uh, when you add radioactivity, uh, proteins that will be synthesizing at that time, only they will be incorporating radioactivity. Okay? And at that time, if you digest it with a protease, then you can see that the count that is associated with uh, free uh, polysome that will go down dramatically. A bound polysome, meaning they are on the membrane surface, there also it will go down dramatically, but you know, a little slower than the free polysome. But those that are associated with the rough microsome, meaning you know, where you have those attached ribosomes, there the count, radioactivity count remained more or less constant over the period of five hour digestion. So proteins that are being synthesized on the uh, microsome and inside that, they are protected from protease uh, mediated digestion. And you can do it even more elegantly that if you isolate those uh, microsomal fractions uh, through centrifugation, and then you uh, digest it and the, see how they are digesting it, that either they take RAF microsome, which has already incorporated radioactive protein, you add, uh, you just check that uh, you know how much of radioactive protein is in there. Again, this is amylase study. And then you take those rough microsomes, you treat it with the, just with detergent. You still see that, uh, and, and th this is the size okay, of the protein. So you still see that this is the same size of the protein. Uh, you, you remember how I talked about this uh, fractionation that uh, uh, depending on the molecular weight, uh, it will come at uh, the different uh, locations. So if you are uh, talking from the bottom of the tube, then the heaviest will come first, like number one, and the lightest will come last, like number 40 or number 100 in this case. So of course, the molecular weight of the protein did not change because both are coming more or less around uh, the, like uh, the tube number 30, you see, it is tube number. Uh, tube number 30, so the molecular weight remains the same because detergent is not, not supposed to do anything right, to the molecular weight of the protein. You take rough microsome here, add detergent to it. Now you see that even now, largely the radioactivity remained intact and the molecular weight still is around that, that uh, the molecular is still the same because it is still coming around tube number 30. Uh, so, and you can see that the total radioactivity here, it was you know, around 1750, uh, uh, here it is around 1300. So largely it is intact. But now you first treat them with detergent and then add the protease. Now you see that very little of the intact protein is left, a much smaller version has been produced. Okay, so what it means is that the proteins that are associated with rough microsome, you know, here, they are inside of a protective shell, which is soluble in detergent. Okay. So today we know that you know it is a lipid uh, recycle, but in 1970 they did not know that they discovered it for the first time, and this is how they discovered it: that the proteins that are associated with the rough microsome they are resistant to protease digestion, but if you first treat them with detergent and then go with the protease, then they can digest, they're digested. So the only way it can happen is that if the protein is inside of a recycle. 
Okay, so just uh, detergent, uh, of course, will not do anything to the protein. Uh, the membrane will be solubilized, but the protein molecular weight will remain the same. If you treat it with, uh, you know, uh, uh, protease, then it cannot gain access to it because uh, to, uh, to, to this protein because the membrane is there. But if you first treat it with uh, detergent, then this membrane will be digested, disrupted, and then the proteins can get access to the protein and chop it off. And that's why the molecular weight is uh, reducing. So this very simple experiment demonstrated that the proteins that are in the rough microsome, they're protected by a detergent soluble uh, uh, compartment. And now we know that it's a membrane. The Another assay which will uh, take a lot of significance later on when I will talk about uh, Jim Rothman's work is uh, sensitivity of secreted protein uh, to uh, this enzyme called endoglycosidase D. So in those days, uh, it was very difficult, like they would not have access to uh, recombinant DNA technology, right? So they cannot uh, make a particular protein inside of a particular cell. They will have to depend on special characteristics of the cell. So uh, in this case, they went for uh, uh, the G protein of uh, vesiculose tomatitis virus or VSV virus. And then uh, they, uh, like they knew that once you infect the cells with VSV, the major protein that will be produced in there is the VSV G protein. And this protein will be, and not only this protein, any protein that is secreted will be decorated with some uh, sugar residues in the ER. So these are uh, N acetyl glucosamine uh, moieties. And these are mannose moieties. Okay. And there is a particular organization. You know, there is a particular branching and particular organization. If this protein, the VSBG protein, moves from endoplasmic reticulum to cis Golgi, there will be some mannose residues will be trimmed. Okay. So you can see by comparison that this one, this one, um, and this one are digested. Okay, are, are not there. Those mannose residues are not there. This particular uh, sugar uh, polymer, uh, like the two mannose, the inositol glucosamine and the, this five mannose, that is a very good substrate for this enzyme called endoglycosidase D. So if you treat proteins that are in cis Golgi with endoglycosidase D, it will release the sugar decoration. But as long as they are inside uh, the cis the ER, where the streaming has not happened, they're resistant to uh, endoglycosidase D. Now, if you simply uh, are tracking, uh, you know, say you label with radioactivity, so all the newly made uh, uh, VSBG is uh, decorated with uh, like, uh, uh, all, all the newly made VSVG is uh, radioactive, then you can see that uh, by uh, treating with endoglycosidase D, which will uh, cause the creation of the uh, lower molecular weight uh, uh, version of this protein, because you are removing the sugar residues, right? So initially it is at high molecular weight, high molecular weight, 10 minutes later, you see the low molecular weight one. So that is the cis Golgi sensitive. Um, and then eventually that becomes a majority, okay? So you know that uh, proteins are moving from uh, ER to Golgi and you can uh, look at it uh, by making a graph as well that uh, 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 like uh, what is the rate of accumulation of this uh, lower band or uh, endoglycosidase D sensitive uh, protein uh, you see that with time that uh, increases and eventually it will plateau. So that's, uh, and, and, and that you cannot do at an elevated temperature. So this is a temperature sensitive process. This movement of the protein from uh, um, endoglycosidase uh, uh, D resistant compartment to the sensitive compartment is uh, a temperature sensitive process. So if you raise the temperature, it cannot move. Uh, so that, that's what it is. 
So based on all these different kinds of studies, Palladi made uh, his model that uh, proteins are made on uh, you know, attached uh, polysomes and they are transported vectorially inside the ER lumen and they move uh, by doing, you know, they have done uh, various time course assays and then did electron micrography to figure out exactly where the location of the newly synthesized proteins are. So they concluded that, you know, they move from ER to the uh, to, to the intermediate element before Golgi and then through the Golgi stacks and eventually to the uh, trans Golgi. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, that is uh, schematically shown here that initially uh, mRNAs start to get translated in the cytosol, then they have two options. If they, the what is being translated, if there is a, a signal peptide attached to it, the red part, then they will attach to the endoplasmic reticulum and uh, the protein will be inserted inside the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. And then from there, uh, it will, uh, you know, like depending on the particular protein, uh, it will be a different, say it is decorated on the surface of the ER, uh, ER membrane. And then it will move from there to the different Golgi complexes eventually to, uh, you know, like plasma membrane or the lysosome if it is to be degraded. Alternatively, you know, if it is uh, destined to go to uh, other destinations, you know, it, it can go to the nucleus, it can go to the mitochondria, it can go to the chloroplast, all depending on what kind of uh, signal peptide it is uh, in there. Okay, so how some of these, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, postulations were made, I will cover that uh, in the next lecture. Okay, thank you.